Sorry. Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Cousins. I'm deputy CEO of the UN Foundation. Imagine not having the food necessary for a healthy and productive life. For one in nine people around the world, that is their daily reality. They are of all ages, from babies whose mothers cannot produce enough milk to the elderly with no relatives to care for them. They are the unemployed inhabitants of urban slums, the landless farmers tilling other people's fields, children orphaned by disease or disaster, and the sick who have to meet special nutritional needs to survive. They are people affected by conflict, natural disasters, and other emergencies. In South Sudan, the youngest country in the world, born so proudly barely five years ago, two and a half out of 11 million people don't know where their next meal will come from. That is 84% higher than at the same time last year. Well, your first thought might be, well, there's conflict there, so what do you expect? But in South Sudan, food insecurity is spreading beyond areas of acute conflict, as rising prices, impassable roads, and dysfunctional markets are preventing families, even in towns and cities, from accessing food. And food insecurity, coupled with conflict, is forcing many families to leave South Sudan. In the last few months alone, an estimated 100,000 South Sudanese citizens have crossed into Sudan, Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Uganda, and this number is expected to grow. To talk more about how food insecurity is triggering population movements in South Sudan and elsewhere, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. I first got to know her when we both worked for the State Department, and we kept getting each other's email, e-cousin, e-cousins, and people kept saying, what are you doing in New York? Aren't you supposed to be in Rome? Well, we quickly sorted it all out. But I couldn't have been more honored by the serendipity in our names. Because Earthrin is truly one of the world's finest souls. She has dedicated her time, her tenacity, and her talents to serving the world's most vulnerable and to coming up with solutions that can change their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to the Executive Director of the World Food Program, Earthrin Cousin. What was the, thing, the deciding factor? Why did he, after all this time, trying to build a new country? Why is he leaving now? I am leaving with anger and sadness because hunger is forcing me to leave my homeland. The homeland is your home. If there was food for us to eat, I would not even think of leaving. It's very far from here to Darfur. We will have to walk day and night for two weeks.
I'm the social good editor at Mashable, um, and of course, as she was already introduced, I'm joined by Ertherin Cousin, executive director of the World Food Program, which is you know, the world's largest humanitarian agency focused on hunger. Um, and of course, you know, we just watched that video, which you know, shows uh, the harrowing experiences that so many uh, refugees and forcibly displaced people uh, experience around the world. Um, why don't you tell us about the role of food insecurity uh, in the, this refugee crisis, uh, especially in areas of conflict like South Sudan? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. You just saw a very sobering piece of life for too many people, now five million people in South Sudan who suffer from severe food insecurity. Uh, when this conflict in South Sudan began some three years ago, four, three and a half years ago, we, it was focused on three states, Jongalai, Unity, and Upper Nile. And we avoided a famine because the WFP, UNICEF, working together, were able to get in there and provide support to people. But it didn't stop them from moving. Hundreds of thousands of people moved to uh, Ethiopia and to Kenya, um, and some even into Uganda. Now, we had a cessation of hostilities. Fighting stops. But then it starts again. But this time, when it starts again, it becomes much more tribal. So it's in equatorial, in the equatorial areas of South Sudan, which are the most fertile areas in the entire country, where we were working with farmers to help them increase the quality and quantity of their yields. But now farmers are walking away into Uganda, trying to ensure that they can have, provide the safety that is necessary, as well as provide the food. People on the move. In, Think about how bad it must be in northern Baragazal, in, in South Sudan, if you think it's better in Darfur than it is in South Sudan. And people, hundreds of thousands of people, walking to Darfur because we could not access them because of the ongoing fighting. Wow. In, um, Eastern uh, Bargazal, we were forced to support people inside while now we're working with UNICEF to try and again create those strike teams where we'll take helicopters, bring in staff, fly, fly food in, do a distribution and get the staff back out there. Humanitarian space shrinks giving us less access to the people in need, forcing people to move in order to try and feed their children. It's a perpetual cycle that occurs. And when they are moving, you saw the kind of things that they're eating. It's not as if they move and they pack up a lunch. They eat what's along the way, lily pads. I've talked to so many women who walk through swamps who fed their children lily pads just to keep their stomachs filled. Or the, the, the leaves that you saw the woman uh, picking, she will boil those leaves up to three times just so her children can digest them because they're so difficult to digest. No nutritional content at all, just keeps the stomach filled. And it's obviously not just South Sudan. You know, over the past two days, we've had various people from, uh, you know, all different organizations, from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to refugees themselves telling their personal stories. So uh, for the World Pro uh, Food Program, for the crisis at large, you know, what are your priorities? How are you tackling this issue? Well, we're tackling it one hungry child, one hungry family at a time, as we always do, ensuring that we can reach tough people living in vulnerable places across the entire globe. Uh, I talked about the five million people in South Sudan who are food insecure. We're working right now to scale up to feed 4.1 million of those people before the end of the year on a regular basis. At, in in uh, Syria, we've been feeding over a million people inside Syria for the last five years, and another 1.4 
1.4 million people who've left Syria in the five surrounding countries. Dadaab, uh, Kakuma, three generations of people that we've been feeding from Somalia who are living in Kenya. I just left Afghanistan, where there are 1.2 million undocumented refugees and a million re documented refugees. The Pakistanis are sending back the undocumented refugees into Afghanistan. So that what that means is that in addition to those that we continue to feed in Pakistan, we're providing support to returnees, some who haven't lived in their own country, for for a decade uh, to provide them with the kind of food assistance that they need to get resettled. In um, Nigeria, Boko Haram is forcing people out of Nigeria into Chad, into Cameroon, into Niger. And so you're seeing a population on the move where we have seen, one, as one of my people described to me, she hadn't seen the likes of the level of malnutrition of the children in in Northeast Nigeria, in the, as the areas become liberated from Boko Haram, only in pictures mm -hmm. of children from the camps in Auschwitz wow. has she seen that level of malnutrition, mm -hmm. as the, the level of malnutrition that we're seeing. But we're working with UNICEF and with the generosity of the global community to invest in the tools that are necessary to provide the support for meeting the needs of all of these people. Mm -hmm. And I think tools, uh, you're saying tools is a good segue into my next question. I want to talk about innovation because mm -hmm. um, I think people hear World Food Program and many uh, will immediately think of aid workers, uh, you know, bringing large sacks of food to areas in need, which of course is crucial and life saving. Um, but there's also technological innovation happening. So I'd like to hear uh, more about, you know, different innovations that you've implemented specifically. Uh, I'm interested in hearing about the Share the Meal app, uh, which is big, and also, uh, you know, iris scanning in right. refugee camps for, for food. Well, the, the reality of it is we can't keep saving the same lives every year. And in order for us to change lives, it means we need to do things differently. It means in situations where there is no food, you'll see those bags of food like you just saw in that video. But where there is food, but people are so poor or they're on the move, they can't access it, we provide them with cash-based transfers that give them the ability to purchase that food, whether it's from a retail or from the local market. And we are doing that in in places like Kakuma and um, in Jordan through an iris scan now, which means that we know that money is going to exactly that family, that woman who needs it to feed her child. We have innovations like Share the Meal, which you talked about, which give the public an opportunity to assist us in providing support. You can share a meal with a school child. We talk about education. We must have education for these people who are on the move and those who are affected by crisis, but that means they also also need food. So what Share the Meal does is gives the ability for any individual through an app to purchase meals, to purchase school meals for a child so that child can be educated and have a full stomach. We call it nourishing bodies and nourishing minds. We have MVAM, which gives us the ability to talk directly to the beneficiaries, mobile assessments. Gives us the ability through mobile phones to talk directly to the, um, those we serve. What we're really excited about, though, is that all of this is being pushed by the accelerator that we've now opened up, the Innovation Accelerator that we've opened in Germany, which we are taking lessons from the private sector about moving fast with new ideas to determine what's going to work and having the capacity then to scale up those new ideas. Reaching people faster, reaching them more efficiently, more effectively, and providing the services that they need. And speaking of those ideas that you know need to be scaled up, uh, I mean, the the population of people who are displaced is at a record high since World War II, 65.3 million people. Um, and that's a big reason why there are two specific summits this week focusing on this crisis. There's the UN Summit on Refugees and Migrants and also the Leaders Summit. Um, what do you hope to see come out of those summits? What we hope to see is a global commitment 
to not just, as I said, saving lives, providing the financial support to ensure that we can meet the needs of those people who don't have access to their homes uh, and, and can't provide for themselves, but also a commitment to helping change lives, giving us the capacity to provide hope and opportunity for people who didn't ask to be refugees, but who need our assistance until they can go home or to help them settle in a, a host community or a third party government where they can ultimately feed their own children. So what we're hoping is that the global community acknowledges that this is not the problem of just one country or one organization, that we live on a small planet. And unless we can provide the hope and opportunity to give people the capacity to stay in their homes, to, to educate their children, to feed their families, the movement of population that we're seeing today is just the tip of the iceberg. And so we need to do things differently. And what I'm hoping is that this summit will bring together leaders around the world committing to do just that, provide a different access to opportunity for people who need us now so that they can take care of themselves in the future. Mm -hmm. And you know those summits are, as you just said, you know leaders of the world, and you know it's very high level. Um, but the situation can feel make people feel so helpless on an individual level. So what can the average person do to help in this crisis? Well, that's why we have the Share the Meal app, um, and I would invite people to go to the to Google, bring the, the Google App Store, bring the app down, join us, become part of the community, helping us provide the assistance that is necessary to the so many of the children that we serve around the world with school meals. I'd ask people to go to WFP's website, www.wfp.org, and learn more about what we're doing and let your voice voice be heard. Public will is built with, to, for leaders when their populations care. And people, too many leaders don't think that individuals care, that xenophobia defines us all. But I believe they're wrong, that people do care. Every faith in the world believes we should feed the hungry. That's what brings us together. We should come together around what we share and recognize that that is what will help us ensure that this small planet that we live on, that we can leave it in a better, in a better place than it is today for our children. That those children that you saw on that screen have the opportunity to support their own children in the future. Individuals can make a difference. It's when the collective voices of people who care come together to say they want their leaders to invest their tax dollars in providing hope and opportunity for the tough people living in vulnerable places that we can make a difference. Well, I think that's actually a great note to end on. Uh, Earthrin, thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you all very much.